Tonight's forum is also sponsored by WR, WURD 96.1 FM, 900 AM, who will also be live broadcasting the entire event tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank the American Friends Service Committee for hosting us here at the Friends Center and helping make this happen. Um, special thanks are also due to the Deaf Hearing Communication Center, who will be providing ASL for the entire event um, for our um, hearing impaired family here and at home. We're also live streaming the event on Facebook Live. Um, so that's exciting. Um, yeah, if you could please take this time to um, put your phones on vibrate or silent. Um, and so, yeah, I uh, also would like to note um, that Black Lives Matter Philly um, does not support or endorse any particular candidate, and we haven't made any such endorsement. And um, Witnesses to Hunger has not um, endorsed a candidate either. Um, so um, now we're just going to have a few words of welcome from our co-sponsor, um, Witnesses to Hunger. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good evening, everyone. Here we go. Good evening. My name is Tiana Gaines Turner, and I'm one of the members of Witnesses to Hunger. I have one of my witness sisters here as well as Mara Young and Angela Nike Sutton. And we are advocates. Um, what we do is we use our photographs to inform local, federal, and state government about the importance of injustice, poverty, depression, low wages, health care. So um, Witnesses to Hunger started in 2008, and um, we're very happy to be here with Black Lives Matter because we, this is a very important subject to us. We speak out a lot about just not racial injustice, but wage gouging as well. Um, so thank you so much for all coming out. And if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to ask us. Thank you. Um, um, I'd also like to take a moment just to do a special shout out um, to the people who helped put this night together. We were a very small team of four people, um, but um, there were mighty people. Um, and we also had like people helping in here and there. But I wanted to thank um, Cricket, Jason, and Devrin, particularly for um, all their hard work in putting this together. Um, so Black Lives Matter Philadelphia, um, we're a black-centered organization that collaborates with partners to build a politically and economically empowered, healthy and whole black community with the ultimate goal of building black power and liberation for all people. Um, black Lives Matter Philly is the only chapter in, Phil in Pennsylvania that's affiliated with the national organization that was founded by Alicia Garcia or Garza Patrice Colors and Opal Tameni. Um, we also, before we get started, want to take a moment to acknowledge that uh, a man was uh, shot and killed this morning by Philadelphia police um, in Southwest Philadelphia. Um, Black Lives Matter Philly, we want to extend our condolences to the family. We don't know a lot about the shooting right now. Um, we're just hoping that um, there's transparency and accountability um, uh, in the wake of this shooting. Um, and for us, it just underscores why this forum is so important and why this upcoming election is so important to us. Um, we are holding this forum because we understand the importance of this coming um, election, not to only, yeah, to only, um, not only reshape the criminal justice system in Philly, but um, to impact the everyday lives of black Philadelphians. Um, at Black Lives Matter Philly, we um, champion the lives of all black people. Um, that's black women, black children, black men, um, our black queer and trans family, uh, black immigrants, um, black people with disabilities, black sex workers, um, black people who are homeless with addictions, um, black people who are, have mental health concerns, all black people. 
um, we know that nationwide mass incarceration and criminalization disproportionately affects black and brown people of color, um, especially Native Americans and our Latinx siblings. Um, during their lifetime, one in 17 white men face imprisonment. Compare that to one in three black men and one in six Latino men. We also care about this election because we know that the upcoming, the incoming district attorney will have enormous power to push for police accountability and transparency. Police killings of black and brown people nationwide are still a problem, um, although it no longer makes the daily news like it used to. Um, last year, 1,092 people were killed by police. Um, so far in 2017, 426 people have been killed by police. Again, black people, Native Americans, and Latinx people are disproportionately the victims of police killings. These killings rarely result in criminal charges and almost never result in per prosecutions and convictions. Um, these national figures and statistics can be staggering and very disheartening, um, especially with the current administration making every move to roll back the very small, modest reforms we were able to get and to take away um, our individual rights to free speech and, um, and collective action. Um, just yesterday, um, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, um, he directed federal prosecutors to seek the most serious criminal charges against suspects, um, a move that is projected to reverse the recent declines we've had in the overcrowded federal prison system. So when you came in, hopefully you got a, a sample ballot. It looks like this. Um, I wanted to um, just direct you to it uh, before we get to the judicial portion of the evening. Um, when you step into the voting booth on the 16th, um, most of you probably know this, but you'll only be able to um, vote um, for the party that you registered for. Um, and so the only exception to this is for um, one judge, um, his name is Vincent Furlong, whose name appears under both uh, political affiliations. Um, there are also two ballot questions. Um, that are going to be on the ballot, that is a, a good idea to look at, um, just sort of get an understanding before you go into the, the poll. Um, if you go to the Committee of 70's website, they have um, links to the plain English explanations of these ballot questions. So we're going to open up our question and answer period with 12 candidates for the Court of Common Pleas. Um, the judges elected for the Court of Common Pleas preside over cases that deal with felony um, charges, domestic violence, juvenile delinquency, voter ID laws, termination of parental rights, and asset forfeiture, to name a few. Um, at the table, we've already welcomed um, our candidates. Um, we have um, Henry McGregor Sayas, um, Ms. Daniel Patterson, Vicki Christensen, Judge Lucretia Clemens, Wendy Barish, Deborah Canty, Zach Schaefer, Mark Moore, Leon Goodman, Terry Michelle Booker, and Judge um, Stella Sai. And I think William Rice um, was supposed to come but couldn't come. And so, yes, we have John Macaretti um, here instead. Um, so if each candidate um, could just take 30 seconds to introduce themselves, we'll start with um, John Macaretti. We have um, microphones in the middle, if you could just pass them to one another. You might have to turn them on. Um, they're probably off. Okay. Yes, this is Wiley's. All right, hello everybody. I hope, hope you can all hear me. My name is John Macaretta. I'm running for the Court of Common Pleas, for Judge of Common Pleas. Been a lawyer 26 years in Philadelphia. For the last 16 years, I've lived in Mount Airy. My wife and I are raising our teenage children there. Following up on the introduction, I'm acutely aware of the many shootings that happen not far from my house, in East, mostly in East Mount Airy or in Germantown. 
I'm very conscious of the problems you're concerned about here today. I'm sure I'll get to say more later on. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Stella Tsai. I was, I'm a judge. I was appointed by Governor Wolf to sit on the Court of Common Pleas in 2016, and I am sitting now in room 804 over at the Criminal Justice Center. I handle criminal cases. 1985 grad of Penn State, 1998 Penn Law grad, child of immigrants who came to the United States to be free, and it's my privilege every day to protect, preserve, and enforce the Constitution. So thank you. Your time. And number 13, by the way. Hi, good, good evening. My name is Terry Booker. Um, my number is 39. I'm a Democrat. Um, I'm running for the Court of Common Pleas and Black Lives Matter because my life matters. Good evening. My name is Leon Goodman. I'm number 26 on the ballot. I'm recommended by the bar. I practiced law for 21 years. I've been a, both a prosecutor and a defense attorney, and I also handle matters in mental health court. I'm one of five attorneys in the city that handle those types of matters. <clears throat> in terms of my background, as I've indicated, I've done it all. I've sat on all sides of the courtroom. I understand how the courtroom is supposed to work. I understand that the Constitution is here to protect us, not to offend us, but to protect us from the government, and that would be my approach. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mark Moore. My ballot number is 37. I've been a trial lawyer in Philadelphia for the past 19 years. 13 of these years, I was an assistant DA here in Philadelphia past five years, I'm a civil defense attorney representing individuals who've been sued in civil court. Uh, I'm a lifelong Philadelphian, born and raised here, Central High School grad, and clearly I understand the problems that this country faces, especially when it comes to people of color. Good evening. My name is Zach Schaefer. I'm button number 31, recommended by the Bar Association, one of only two candidates running, including Mr. Goodman that are Rule 801 certified, that is, if someone's life is actually on the line in terms of a capital homicide case, we're allowed to represent them. But number 31. Good evening. My name is Deborah Canty, button number 27. I was born here in Philadelphia, raised in Liberia, West Africa, came back to Philadelphia when I was 12 and have lived here ever since. I have both a master's in social work and my law degree. For the last nine years, I was working for DHS as a city solicitor. Hi, everyone. Thank you for welcoming us here tonight. My name is Wendy Barish. I'm number 29 on the ballot. I am someone that fell into a depression after the election in November because I've been a civil rights attorney for more than 20 years, and it's time for me to step up and make sure that everyone in this room gets the same dignity and respect in that courtroom that they're entitled to. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I am Lucretia Clemens. I was appointed by Governor Wolf to the bench last year. My button number is 40. Uh, most importantly, I have three sons, 19, 18, and four, and a husband. And I'm from St. Louis, actually a little town next to a town you've all heard of called Florissant, which is next to Ferguson. That street you saw burning up is the street I drove down every day to get home. So I understand the importance of what we're going to be talking about here today. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Vicki Christensen. I'm a candidate for the Court of Common Pleas. My ballot number is 14. I'm a lawyer at a nonprofit, and our mission is to refine the criminal justice response to cases of violence against women and children. I'm running for judge because I want to run a trauma-informed courtroom. Thank you. Good evening. I am Danielle Patterson, and I am from the community, committed to being in the community and serving the community. I woke up on November the 9th to a nightmare, recognizing that someone who would run an entire campaign against people who look like me from communities that look like mine had actually become the president and got off the couch and decided that I would run because I needed to protect my community. I'm going to ask you on election day to make it great. Make sure you push button number 38. Good evening, my name is Henry Sias. Uh, I am an out trans man, and if elected, I will be the first transgender man to take the bench in the United States. I have been in Philly for 10 years. I've clerked for two state Supreme Court justices, a homicide judge, and a mass torts judge here in town. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Philadelphia Lawyers for Social Equity. We host the Expungement Project. 
We have done thousands of free expungements for low-income Philadelphians. And I'm very proud of that work. I'm number 18. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you to all our candidates for coming. Um, before I go into the questions, um, I just wanted to touch on a few rules um, by which judges have to abide um, that might limit um, how our candidates respond to the questions. Um, so a candidate shall not act as a leader in or hold an office in a political organization. A candidate is prohibited from making commitments with respect to cases, controversies, or issues that are likely to come before the court and a candidate for judicial office um, may state personal views on legal, political, or other issues, but may not make pledges or promises other than the faithful and impartial performance of the duties of the office. Um, so according to um, the NAACP in Philadelphia, um, we have the highest rate of incarceration among all large jurisdictions in the United States. 72% um, of people waiting in jail to be tried are African American, mostly men between the ages of 18 and 64, um, who only make up 12% of Philadelphia's population. The time spent waiting for trial is four times longer than the national average, and 60% of people in Philly prisons awaiting trial are there for low-level, nonviolent offenses. Um, so the sentencing project, they said in a quote, in the face of it, the criminal law is colorblind and class blind, but in a sense, this only makes the problem worse. The rhetoric of the criminal justice system sends the message that our society carefully protects everyone's constitutional rights, but in practice, the rules assure that law enforcement prerogatives will generally prevail over the rights of minorities and the poor. So my first question is, um, to which you have uh, about 50 seconds to respond each. 50. Yeah, not 15. That would be, yeah, that's, that's me. 50 seconds. <laughs> um, so what do you believe are the causes of the high rates of minority incarceration in the United States? Anyone can answer that question. And also, if you could um, say your name before you speak so that the radio audience knows who's talking. Hello? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Just bear with me. My voice is kind of uh, shaky. My allergies are bad. Uh, this is Terry Booker, number 39. And why, the question is, why do you think, why are there so many incarcerated people of color? Yes, basically. Okay. So I, I believe uh, there's a lot of incarceration of people of color because, I mean, if you look at the history of the police department, uh, the police department was uh, built to originally catch slaves. So that's, that's the original, the root of the police department. So uh, when I feel like you have a police department that's built on that and as the generations go on uh, and you are trained and you have all these biases that are put out in society, the media, those types of things that lead you to believe that, oh, these types of people are the people who are starting the most trouble. That is part of the reason why you say, oh, well, they are the troublemakers, so we have to arrest them. And then it's just, and it goes on and on. So if you're the most arrested, then you're the most prosecuted, and then you're the most in prison. So. Thank you. Would someone else like to respond? Um, and also, please say your name again. Uh. Hello. Oh. Lucretia Clemens. I, I am a sitting judge. I s hear cases from Kensington and North Philadelphia, east of the river. All day, I, oh, I'm sorry, east of Broad Street. All I hear all day is black and brown boys, cases of nonviolent drug offenses. 90% of my cases are nonviolent drug offenses. The reason for the surge in incarceration is the war on drugs, period. That's what it is. Um, though, and how do we deal with that? Half of the people who come before me are either drug addicted and or mentally ill. They need treatment, not jail. And for those who are committing those uh, nonviolent drug offenses because of economic uh, reasons, 
They need education and an opportunity to earn a living wage. Um, that's what I do every day. I'm in courtroom 604. Come and see me. Uh, my name is Vicki Christensen. I, I just wanted to, um, to add to that. A lot of our, the candidates, we know each other very well. We spend about six months uh, with each other at this point every day. Um, so a lot of times when one of us will start to speak, many of us will know, and, and, um, and Judge Clemens says she hears these issues every day. The other thing I want to point out and piggybacking on what she said is the importance of our understanding and acknowledging um, what is happening in our schools. And most of the people in this room are fully aware that we have um, a, a school to prison pipeline. And for both our boys, and we need to talk about this more, and our girls, an abuse to prison pipeline. Hi, I'm John Macaretta. Um, we do have too many people incarcerated, and we could do better getting less of them out of prison earlier, more of them out of prison earlier on. There could be more home, home monitoring, home detention, ankle bracelets, ways to divert people out of the system early on. Even from the earliest case, a judge can treat a first offender differently than a third offender, maybe guide a kid off of the wrong path as opposed to sending him on a path to a lifetime of being a repeat offender. Um, bail is too high. There are a lot of people who, you, who can't make $500 bail and shouldn't have to put up $500 bail. So as a result, like you said, they sit in jail much longer than they should. Um, these are the kind of things that judges and the system can do in many cases to keep people out of jail before or after trial that don't need to be there. Thank you. Okay. Hello, um, I'm Stella Tsai. I'm a sitting judge, and I too have uh, cases involving, if you look at the demographics, largely people of color who come before me. And I have to say that some of these decisions are prosecution and enforcement, and I believe that there is, uh, from what I can see, and to the extent I can talk about this, um, and Ms. Booker alluded to earlier, are the issues about bias and implicit bias and um, attempts to enforce uh, laws if we do it uh, judicially. And we try, when I'm in the courtroom, to ensure that we uh, enforce that, as I said, enforce the Constitution, apply it, to make sure that uh, people, their rights are protected, and that uh, to check the abuses of power. Danielle Patterson, I'm sorry, got stuck. All of the issues and ills that we've discussed are important. However, we've got to recognize that there's a lack of underlying empathy and understanding of the underlying issues that are going on in our communities that are leading to these ills and the overcriminalization of their behaviors. Things that were once just childhood behavior are now bullying and harassment. So instead of understanding what's going on in the home that might lead to these behaviors, we've got early criminalization of our children, which leads to, unfortunately, a lifetime of bias towards them because that record follows you for life. And then we see over and over again with the rest, the profiles, what happens. And this leads to more incarceration instead of diversionary programs. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Mark Moore. We talk specifically about individuals... In People of color incarcerated, there are two types. People who are sitting in, in prison because of their waiting trial, and there's individuals who've been convicted. When you talk about people who are sitting in prison awaiting trial, you look at, well, why is their case taking so long to get to, to trial? You, the judges should be pushing these cases forward. Um, the police officers and the police department need to look at who they're actually charging, and the DA's office needs to look at and scrutinize better who they're actually charging. Now, when we talk about individuals who are convicted are sitting in prison in long-term sentences. When you look at the judges and you look at the juries and you look at the evidence and lack of evidence that's been presented against them, and then you have cases like individuals who've been sitting in prison or who've been convicted falsely and been in prison for 15 and 20 years. I mean, it's, each aspect of the system plays a part, and we have to demand each aspect of the system do their job. Judges need to move these cases along. DA's office needs to filter out and be a be do better as uh, who they're charging. And the police department needs to do a better job as to who they're arresting. More importantly, who are the police department? Who are they bringing in? Who are they vetting? Individuals who they're bringing into the academy, are these individuals just law and order, um, beat individuals hedging, or are they actually trying to be peace officers? 
Leon Goodman, I'd like to also add, there's also a mental health component. Police officers need to be better trained. I found in my mental health practice oftentimes that many of those cases, as it relates to Philadelphia police versus SEPTA police, the SEPTA police go with the mental health component. They bring them to the hospitals. Oftentimes, because Philadelphia doesn't have the same level of training, the Philly cops lock people up. And so that training aspect right there can make a difference. Because when someone is suffering from or dealing with the effects of mental illness, they're obviously not in the position where they understand and are doing things in their right mind. And they should be treated differently. So more training and a better understanding of different causes of why these particular things can help to reduce the level of incarceration. Oh, um, just Hello, Henry Sias. I, I just want to say when you work in the system, it's impossible not to see the, the force of structural racism. Some communities are policed on behalf of and some communities are policed at. But what I wanted to add is it's vital that we elect judges who have the strength of character to stand up to structural racism, but it's equally vital that we continue to support those judges because when they make decisions in courtrooms that are gonna be unpopular maybe with the FOP, unpopular with the structures that are producing these inequities, there's gonna be some pushback. So don't just select us, keep supporting us. All right, thank you. Zach Schaefer, but number 31. I think that we need to really reevaluate how we're doing things. The first question that should be asked anytime someone is sentenced is how did they get here? How can we make sure that we craft a sentence so that they never come in front of the court again? We don't look at programs like Future Forward where people go to community college for three semesters and they take classes, either employment or parenting classes based on their needs, and then they have their charges withdrawn. This is a great program, but right now we only have four people in it. This is for people that are first or second time felony offenders. And I'm proud to say that I have a client in that program. She's a mother of two, and instead of her being a felon, she's gonna have an associate's degree. We need solutions like that going forward. Deborah Canty, in addition to what everyone else has already said, is making sure that we understand the underlying causes of what's bringing people in front of us and also understanding real solutions to making sure that they don't come back. I think a lot of times we craft solutions that are not designed to have real effective change. And so we need to make sure that we understand the problem and then also real solutions. Wendy Barish, I think that the problem starts with the initial underlying discrimination that people of color are not given the same type of chance as other people in the world. And most people who commit crimes, sometimes they're selling drugs, not because they want to use the drugs, but because they can't feed their families. And there's an underlying problem in our society where people are at a disadvantage. And people who are disadvantaged may take additional steps to do things that land them to wind up before court. And we need to make sure that we as a society are trying to level the playing field for all people so that equal, everyone has a right to get a job and to live in a home. But there are some basic things that not everyone is treated the same way in this city, and we need to work on that. Great, thank you. Um, the second question, um, uh, some of you already hit on that um, in the first. Um, but um, leading up to Mother's Day, um, Black Lives Matter Philly, Philadelphia Student Union, and several of the other, sorry, um, Philadelphia organizations um, are joining with groups nationwide in the Movement for Black Lives to raise funds to bail mothers out of jail so that they can be with their families on Mother's Day. So far, local groups have raised over $33,000. Um, as of February 2017, there were 6,603 people held in Philadelphia prisons um, who were, uh, you know, overall, 63% of them were awaiting trial. Um, many of them there probably because they could not afford to post bail. Um, for low-income people, even a week or a day in jail can mean the loss of their job, housing, their children, or as we've seen in cases of Sandra Bland and others, their very lives. Um, do you feel that there are problems with the cash bail system? And could you elaborate on what a judge can do to mitigate these problems? Lucretia, are you going to go? <laughs> I, I was going to go because I okay. deal with this every day as well, too. too. 
Take somebody six to nine months from arrest to when they get to my courtroom. I'm in the busiest waiver room in the entire city. What I have, there's very little a court of common pleas judge can do about bail until a person gets to you. They have to be able to wait, make their way through the system. So what I have done is cut the wait time from your last preliminary hearing in municipal court to when you get to me from three months when I took over last year to two weeks. How did I do that? There are lawyers in here who are mad at me right now because I don't grant continuances. <laughs> Show up on time, be prepared, and try your case. There are people who wait three and four months to get a date in my room. Nobody should have to sit in jail for six months because they don't have $500 so they could see a judge. It's, the system as it's set up does not work, and I'm pretty much outraged by it every day. Thank you. Thank you. Here, here. And um, again, as a reminder, if you could all say your name before you um, give your reply for the radio audience. All right, thank you. Um, I would join Judge Clemens in the desire to ensure that we do not have people sitting in jail. We, are, we monitor that to make sure that, um, and we talk to the attorneys to make sure that they represent their clients in a way that encourages them to, uh, to uh, reduce the amount of time that people have to wait for their uh, trial. Also, uh, if, there's no, if there's no particular concerns about flight risk, um, we will often uh, grant uh, bail without rec on, on reconnaissance, we call it ROR, and uh, I, we haven't had really many problems about that. People show up. So I think that uh, it's a system that we can work really well if we are on top, stay on top of it. This is Vicki Christensen. I can assure you, again, we've all spent six months together. Everyone on this panel feels the same way about this issue. I promise you. I can, everybody just, we can say, save you some time. We all feel the same way about this issue. <laughs> this is an obvious issue. It's obvious. OK, thank you. Um, but would anyone care to elaborate? I don't want to not give you the opportunity if you want to say more about that. Leon Goodman, um, one of the first issues with bail, it frankly usually begins in arraignment court. Honestly and realistically, if you've hired a private attorney, your bail is going to be set at a lower level than someone who has the public defender. Because unfortunately, with the volume of cases that the public defender's office has, it literally is a case of what's up next, okay, you look at the guidelines, Whatever the DA's representative asks for typically is what you get. When you have a private attorney, someone that is prepared, someone has uh, a strategy, someone that has a focus, that person usually gets a much lower bail and then they're in a position where they can get out. And that's not fair. But that realistically is part of the problem that we have in Philadelphia. Just one quick story. This is Zach Schaefer, button number 31. I had a case that the court appointed me to do. I was paid $400 to do this case. This young man's bail was $1,000. He sat in jail because he had a fight. Somebody lost their wallet during the fight. They charged him with robbery. He sat in jail for four months until we were able to get his bail down to $500, and his poor grandmother had all these fish fries to raise up that $500 to get him out. Now, the problem is that after we finished his trial where he was found guilty of a misdemeanor of third degree and given six months probation, the real sentence was that he did not graduate high school he did not start a community college, and he lost his part-time job. That does not make us safer in any sense. We really need to reevaluate bail. Thank you. Does anyone else care to respond? Do you agree with us? I do agree. As Vicki said, we all agree that there need to be less people paying less bail in the system. John Macaretta, number 16. So let me end on this. You started with Mother's Day. You know, there's a lot of mothers on the other side. Every, every Sunday I drive by, I see the bus on Washington Lane taking moms and families out to see their families at Greaterford as well. So that's another victim that the system needs to keep, uh, keep in mind. Every defendant has a mother who's suffering as well. So since you started with Mother's Day, I'm going to end with that. Thank you. Thank you. For the third question, um, the country right now is in the midst of a political crisis um, that we all know, um, where fundamental constitutional rights are under attack and vulnerable communities are being made even more vulnerable. 
The power of the course is also being challenged in unprecedented ways, um, mostly by the executive branch. Um, what are your beliefs about the role of courts in judges in our current political climate? Again, preface your response with your name. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Moore, ballot number 37. I mean, if you've been reading the paper, you see that federal judges and state judges are like the first line of defense against, and I'm not even going to call his name, 45. Um, I mean, the, the, he's finding that uh, for all his bluster, the laws still hold. Federal judges and state and local judges have the power and the sovereignty to stop some of, the, uh, some of his foolish executive orders that come down. Now, remember, the states are their own sovereignty. The federal government is its own sovereignty, but the states have a constitution as well. And so a, f a state judge has its, his or her own power. And what you need and what you're starting to see is judges who, are, who aren't afraid to stand up to 45 um, and uh, criticism that comes along with standing along up, up to the president. You have to be firm and know the fact that you have a power and you're not going to let him or any one of his cronies break the law. Uh, and you have the power and you need to stand up and do it. I'm Wendy Barish. I'm Wendy Barish. I'm number 29. This is exactly why I'm running, because what's happening in this country right now, I feel that people are in jeopardy, and that people in this room and people who came before us had to fight for civil rights that they never should have had to fight for to begin with. And it is a judge's job to make sure that people are treated appropriately and their constitutional rights are upheld in that courtroom and that we stand up to people that are above us when we need to to protect those rights. And you need judges on the bench who are not afraid to do that and that will protect the people, no matter where they come from or what they believe in, that are entitled to respect in this country and the rights that people earned that they should never have even had to fight for to begin with. Leon Goodman, number 26. And that segues into what I said when I first spoke. The Constitution is here to limit the government of what it can do to the citizens. It doesn't grant us rights. It tells the government what it cannot do to us. And as you've heard from the various judges here, that's the philosophy that we all have, that we view that Constitution as the protector of all of you. Not what gives you rights, but what keeps the governments from infringing on your rights. Danielle Patterson, number 38. When our forefathers founded this country, they put a check on government, period. That third balancing act is the courts. And we spend all our time worried about the Supreme Court. But in order to get to SCOTUS, you've got to focus on the lower level courts and the kind of characteristics and values that those individuals have and how they view the Constitution. Justice Sotomayor tells us that it is their diversity of the bench and the underlying issues and the different practices that lawyers have that make them good jurists because they're able to understand the Constitution as a living document as it applies to our people as we live here today. One of the issues here, as we deal with 45, is that he wants to take us back 50 years to what he believes is the real Constitution and how it should be applied. So you have choices to make whether or not you value certain things in your life and you want judges on the bench who have those values. Thank you. Uh, Vicki Christensen, I'll just add to that. Uh, Danielle brought up uh, a, a very recent uh, Supreme Court opinion that, that talked about attenuating circumstances. And this is a reminder to everybody of how important it is to look very carefully at your candidates' backgrounds and to look very carefully at, at the, the work that we've done and, and what our values are. Um, because a lot of times the law comes down from higher courts and it is, it's vague and it leaves a lot of room for interpretation and judicial discretion. And so when we're getting back to this front line of judges, um, you know, to what extent are your judges going to respect people's rights and their, individual, their individuality and their right to be safe and have privacy? John at number 16. So if the question is, what is the role of courts in the current political environment, I would say the role is to keep doing what they're doing. Stay strong, be focused, and try to reach just and fair verdicts in every case. Judges always face pressure from somebody. Every case, somebody is unhappy with the verdict. The victim's family, the defendant's family are sitting in the courtroom. A lot of these decisions are hard. You're never going to see a responsive tweet from a judge in response to a comment from a politician because judges are ethically prohibited 
from responding to these kind of public comments in public. That's one year we get. That's one reason judges get ten years terms, so they don't have to worry about the political or social pressure of any individual decision, and they're insulated to do the right thing. So what you need is judges who will be strong and do the right thing, no matter what pressure they're facing. Hello, I'm Henry Sias, number 18. I want to uh, say I totally agree with that and just emphasize how important it is to have a bench that represents the city. Uh, 45 has already withdrawn protection from transgender kids in schools. We know that's going to lead to suicides. Kids are going to die because of that. So without the check on executive action in you know, every level of government that judges provide the lives that are at stake are never going to have their moment to face the sovereign. What's so beautiful about the court system, it's, it's a triumph of civilization that the people who are made to play the role of the least of us are allowed to hold accountable the most powerful people in our nation. That, that is a, you know, a greater achievement than like the internet. It is a miracle of the modern world, but we must maintain it together with your support. May I ask Respond? Yes. My name is Stella Tsai, uh, number 13. I wanted to uh, point out that it was a judge who helped protect our right to vote here in Pennsylvania. And that uh, while we have an electoral process, it is, it is a good thing um, that we have this electoral process and that we have judges who ensure that people are not precluded from participating in this process, and that we need to protect that right at all costs. And that was one of the things that um, I did prior to uh, joining the bench, advocating to ensure that, that we could uh, prohibit the use of voter ID. Uh, Terry Booker, number 39. Uh, I, um, I agree um, with a lot of things that were already said, but um, just to elaborate, um, I believe that the judges, the, that's why the Constitution has all three branches so we can to balance everything out. So, and that's what I keep reminding people that if a judge can block what the president did and you think it's important to vote for the president, how important is it to vote for judges? So I just want to remind everyone, vote for your judges, know what, you know, know what they're about, know what they're doing because they're important and they have extreme power because judges are blocking what the president is doing so um, and just like I have a hashtag it's called pursue happiness because in the Constitution that's what it says life liberty and the pursuit of happiness but everyone doesn't get that opportunity so you need to have judges that are willing to give you that opportunity thank you Would everyone get to respond who wants to um, this uh, next question sort of follows up on that in some ways. Um, we began with um, as I, I was saying, um, this next question um, follows up somewhat on the last question um, that was posed. Um, when we began this session, um, you all gave brief introductions um, that included your background and experiences. Um, for this question, um, we want to know what specific experiences um, inform how you approach the law. Um, so maybe point to things um, in your background, maybe before you were on the bench for sitting judges, um, um, for lawyers, your current practice, um, things that you've done or encountered that inform how you approach the law. Deborah Canty, button number 27. A lot of what informs how I approach the law is my background. Prior to going to law school, I spent several years working as a social worker in and out of communities throughout Philadelphia and getting to understand what diff our community was facing because most of the, the individuals that I was working with were people of color. And so being able to understand how things impact, and in fact, that's what motivated me to go back to school was understanding how important it is to be able to advocate on behalf of people and knowing that the people in the courtroom are those who can take away rights from individuals. Uh, 
um, mark more, um, button number 37. I think it's important for a judge to have balance. And, and I think the best way to have balance, for me, is to have been, uh, have an experience of both being a victim and being uh, a, a accused, falsely accused, or defendant, if you will. Um, as a young person, walked in on a holdup, uh, me and my mother, um, laid on the ground, he took our mom, my, my mom's stuff, her car, and I had a young uh, friend of mine who at eight years old was strangled by his cousin. Um, he came home uh, after school. His cousin came over, stole a radio, and to prevent him from telling, he strangled him with his own butt, his own belt buckle. Um, I've also been a victim of and, and had some issues with being harassed by police. When I was younger, I remember one time coming home from Germantown Friends basketball camp. Um, cops pulled us over. A group of them pulled guns out. Young man, and they said, well, you know what? You all fit the flash information of uh, we got a robbery. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. I wondered even then, how in the world could you figure we were, had robbery suspects, we were walking with basketballs in our hand and 32 ounce um, big gulps. So I think it's important as a judge to have both so I can emphasize with both. And I think most judges, you're looking for a judge who can do both. Thank you. This is Wendy Barish again. I became a lawyer and I knew I wanted to be a lawyer at a young age because I have a sister that's handicapped. And growing up, I saw how people treated her differently because she couldn't do things the same way. And while it was okay for me to fight with her, no one else could fight with my sister. So I'm very sensitive to how people treat people that look differently or do things differently unfairly. And that forms the basis of how I look at things. I also have a father who has a record and has been unemployed and homeless in his life, and I've had to support him. So I know that when you sentence a person, you're sentencing a whole family. And I'm very cognizant of that in how I conduct myself and how I would handle things on the bench. Thank you. Zach Schaefer, button number 31. My experience has been informed by the 1,600 plus people I've represented. And in particular, there's one young man who was sentenced to 30 years. He had a court appointed attorney. And I, his father came to me and said, my son didn't do this. His children want him back. I filed an appeal. And in this appeal, I brought up the fact that the judge allowed in this extra evidence from a separate arrest that was actually null prost, which meaning the case was thrown out. It had nothing to do with anything, really. And they allowed this in, and the Superior Court said that was an abuse of discretion. It was so bad that you needed a brand new trial for this young man. So the DA's office appealed it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and he sat in jail for about three years until we got him that brand new trial. And at that new trial, we brought in the evidence that the shooting that was 30 minutes away from his work, he worked at the airport, it happened at 1245, but he logged out with his thumbprint at 1 o'clock. So he walked out of that courthouse an innocent man that almost did 30 years. So judges matter. This is a very important election, people. Zach Schaefer, number 31. Lucretia Clemens, button number 40. My husband has been a federal agent for more than 27 years. When we get pulled over, that cop doesn't know he's a federal agent. I have three sons, two of them are teenagers. I was a partner at one of the largest law firms in the city where I was the first African-American woman ever elevated in the almost 125-year history of that firm from associate to partner. I sit on the bench every day and I watch a parade of black and brown boys whose lives are in turmoil. That is what informs my decision making. And I think that is what guides me every day because I look at those young men and I say, but for the grace of God, go my husband and my sons. Leah. Leon Goodman, number 26. And I, I want to follow up to that. That's correct. Your judges, they come with their life experience. So you need to have judges that have lived, that have seen things. You need to have judges that have worked on both sides, that have an understanding of what it is to prosecute, what it is to sit with the family of a murder victim, what it is to counsel an individual that has been sexually assaulted. But then at the same time, you need to have judges that understand because they worked on the other side as well, having sat with an individual who was wrongfully convicted. Similar to what Zach described, I have a similar story of a client who was convicted of first-degree murder. First-degree murder, and he served 10 years. And a judge, a strong judge, and I will say her name, Judge Sarmina, decided that, you know what, he's entitled to a new trial. And I did that new trial and walked him out of that courthouse free, proving to the jury that the government's witness was, in fact, more likely the person who did the killing. So you need to have judges who have worked on both sides, have sat, and you understand that they're bringing in their life experiences. 
Judges that have been in a situation as Mark has described, walking down the street being stopped, so that when you hear that type of thing, you understand it. But at the same time, judges who have law enforcement in their family as well, because it's a two-way street. So judges with their experiences, and you need to understand. And that's why it's important who you elect, because you want to have those complete type people. My name is Vicki Christensen. I'm number 14 on the ballot. Um, I've devoted my career to survivors of trauma uh, who have survived child abuse, domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. And what's so important to know about people who have survived trauma is that that trauma comes out, comes out in many different ways. And so anybody here who has had any contact with the criminal justice system, working in it, coming into any of our courthouses knows that so many people who come in and maybe are charged with an offense on a Monday, we might see them on a Friday and they might be the victim of, of an offense. And so trauma comes out in so many different ways. It is so important, so important for judges to be able to look and understand what's happening beneath the surface in people's lives and to be able to look at the context of everything, every single incident that comes into that system. John Macaretta. So in the campaign, all the candidates get questionnaires. What was your most important case? And over my career, I've come to understand the answer is every case is the most important case to that client. And that guides my philosophy. My regular practice is class actions. I, rep I sue multinational corporations representing thousands of people for hundreds of millions of dollars. But if I sit in the kitchen of a Philadelphian who I'm representing for free, helping her avoid losing her house to foreclosure because she can't come up with $5,000, that's more important to that person. That's the most important case they'll ever be in. I view myself as an advocate. You're, if a client comes to me, I'm their advocate. I represent them. That's my judicial philosophy. As a judge, you have a different role, but you can still advocate for justice at every opportunity. Danielle Patterson, number 38. During my three years at Villanova Law School, I was stopped by the Radnor, Lower Marion, and Montgomery County Police 34 times. I was on my way to my final job interview at the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office when I was pulled from my vehicle in my fabulous little black suit with my white shirt and my nude stockings. And I ran those stockings because I was on, the, on my knees on the side of the road as my classmates drove down Lancaster Avenue trying to figure out what was going on. I was stopped 34 times and I never received a single citation. Instead, my vehicle was searched, I was pulled from the vehicle, and I was asked lots of questions about why I could possibly be on the main line. I understand what it is to be black in America. I understand what it is to be victimized, I understand what it is to be downtrodden, and I understand what it is to be disenfranchised. I understand that when I am standing there, my education, my socioeconomic status does not matter. And I hope that there is going to be a judge one day who is looking at me with the empathy of eyes who have seen, who have heard, who have been, who have done. And I hope to be that kind of judge. I'm Henry Sias, number 18. It would be impossible for me to address this question without talking about transitioning as an adult professional working in the courts. Now, I'm glad to say I've largely been embraced by my professional community, but I'll probably never see my mother or any blood family member again. And that does hurt. And there are days, even in uh, my professional career, when it's just hard. Like, it would be nice to have one day off from being a trans guy. Just like I'm sure it would be like great to have a day off, you know what I mean? But you just don't get to. So if it's hard for me as a straight white guy who's trans, what must it be like to get out of bed every morning as a trans woman of color who in our city has a life expectancy of 34 years? That's a crisis. That's a bone in my throat every day. And I don't have any easy answers. I just know that if we're not talking about it, it's not going to get better. Terry Booker, number 39. Um, experiences that shape my approach to the law, I would say would be, um, I guess, knowledge, because I, I always focus on people knowing the law, because so many people don't know, like, basic stuff. So when, as I, as 
I sit and I speak to a client and they're like, you know what, you're the first attorney that just listened to me. You actually heard what I was saying is that human approach to connect with people and just know that they don't understand what's going on. They don't understand the law and you do and you have the power to help them. So just being able to help people, that's what I wanted to do. That's why I became a lawyer and that's what I've been doing, helping people with real issues, real things that matter to them. So, thank you. Still Tsai. Um, I wanted to share with you, we're in a Quaker meeting room, um, something I learned when my children were in Quaker school. And a statement which has resonated with me and continues to resonate with me through my practice and through my work as a judge, and there's that of God in all of us. And it is this, it is a statement to me that is profound because it uh, helps me recognize people as individuals and that they all deserve respect and the protection of our laws. And I am uh, a person who has uh, always been, uh, so growing up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, it's, it's uh, identified for what I looked like as opposed to who I was, and it's, it was tough. But um, after growing up, in that environment, um, I am just proud to be here to be able to uh, uphold the laws in a way that's fair. And I use my conscience in doing so. Thank you. That's everyone? Okay. Um, and so we have time for um, one final question. Um, mandatory sentencing requires offender, that offenders serve a predetermined term for certain types of crimes. This is set by the legislature and carried out by the judicial system. Um, so the question for that one is, um, do you feel that judges should be given um, more discretion in these cases? And if so, how might um, judges um, mitigate the harm caused by mandatory sentencing laws? Hello? Okay, Leon Goodman, number 26. Um, I think everyone up here will agree that the whole concept of mandatories has basically been a complete disaster. That's one of the reasons why we have this mass incarceration that exists. Many of those individuals were incarcerated because of, in particular, drug mandatories. Nonviolent offenses, individuals who oftentimes based on socioeconomic situations, had, had limited choices and they chose that approach, and as a result of the mandatories, they were incarcerated. Judges generally did not like them, and fortunately the US Supreme Court did away with them. You all need to know, though, that this is currently a movement in some state legislatures, including this one, to reimpose the mandatories. You need to contact your legislatures and let, you, let, let them know that you're against that type of thing because it takes discretion away from the judges. The person who knows you best, the person who has had a chance to see what you did, the person that has had a chance to judge to make the determination of guilt or innocence is best in the position to determine the appropriate sentence. And when mandatories are there, that judge loses that ability and you become a number, no longer a person. Danielle Patterson, number 38. One of my biggest pet peeves with my clients is they come to me, and I don't know if y'all know this person, but it's my sister's cousin's Uncle Jojo Barber down the street hairstylist told me that they had exactly the same case. And they come to me and they expect that everything's going to happen exactly as those things happen to this unknown person who's apparently famous in Philadelphia. Well, no two cases are the same. No, there cannot be the same approach to any two cases. Yes, we may be functioning under a certain statute of the law, but the circumstances that led to that case, what actually happened in that case are always different. So I don't think you're going to find a judge who's going to want to put a cookie cutter solution on something that is a complex problem and an issue that is before them that's a complex issue. Every person that comes to court is supposed to be respected and treated as an individual and mandatory minimums take that away. One of the things that people don't really realize about mandatory minimums is the actual weight of the drugs that trigger a mandatory minimum. Take a dime, hold it in your hand, feel it, feel that weight. 
if you had that much heroin or cocaine, you would be subject to one to two years under the old mandatory minimum sentencing. It could be your first arrest ever. We need to continue to have diversionary programs in the face of the state legislature that wants to put minimum mandatories back on the books because there are all of these prisons outside of Philadelphia where they're housing our citizens. We need to stop that. We need to have programs like Future Forward, which I talked about earlier, where my client was looking at three to six years. Instead, she's doing three semesters at community college. We need creative solutions going forward in light of this legislature that is hostile to us. Mark Moore, button number 37. Um, you got to look at what's going on. The, the state legislature is now trying to reinstitute mandatory minimums at the same time you're starting to hear the issue of privatization of prisons, which I, I mean, I don't know why there's not more focus on that. Because when you privatize prisons, they become a business. And what's the business? Human product. So the question becomes, you, know, you have to vote. You have to be more civically minded. These are issues that whether you or not you believe it, they do touch you. Philadelphia is a, oh, sorry, Vicki Christensen, number 14. Philadelphia is a city that has some really incredible programs, services, nonprofits, and community groups. And if judges have the ability to look at the whole of an individual, we can help individuals participate in those programs in meaningful ways. And that's something that's very, very helped by discretionary sentencing policies. Lucretia Clemens, button number 40. The main problem with mandatory minimums is that it shifts the power, the decision making from the judge to the district attorney. Your sentence is decided by what you're charged with if you happen to have been doing what you're charged with doing. There are times that the district attorney will, uh, will charge someone with a lesser offense because of circumstances. But there are times where I as a judge say, make a deal. <laughs> and they go and make a deal. But if there's a mandatory minimum, I lose that power. That is the problem, is that it shifts the balance too, uh, too far away from the defendant and too much in favor of the district attorney. Deborah Canty, button number 27. To piggyback off of what Mark was indicating, we have to understand why mandatory sentencing exists, well, existed, and why people are trying to bring it back. People are getting rich off of people being incarcerated. That's the problem. And the community suffers when that happens. One of the things that's very special about Philadelphia, as Vicki indicated, there are a lot of alternative programs that exist. But like she said, if you reinstitute mandatory minimums, all of that discretion goes away. And so the move to try to help people and not be punitive disappears. Terry Booker, number 39. Uh, I agree with most of all what has been said, especially the um, privatization of the prisons, because that's the why, which is important, like Ms. Canty said. So, um, but what I believe is, is if we, ha we have to work together, because we can't do it by ourselves. As judges, we only have a certain amount of power, so if we the people need to come together and say, hey, legislative, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna deal with this anymore. We don't want this anymore. We have the power, we, have to, we keep forgetting that the power is in our vote. We say, oh, you decided you're gonna vote for these mandatory sentences? Okay, we're not gonna vote for you. And then we can eliminate them and then the judges will get the discretion back because that's what it does, it eliminates the discretion of the judge, which you guys, you know, did also vote for. So, that's it. Wendy Barris, number 29. <laughs> Mandatory sentences have no place in our society today. They're, they're not accomplishing anything. They're making the people who run the prisons rich, and they are not preventing people from committing crimes. There's no established record that there's any success with them and they completely disregard what Danielle brought up that every person is an individual and should be treated like an individual and viewed that way when they're being assessed in the courtroom and mandatory sentencing takes that power away from the judge and has no place in a society especially under our current administration the way things are today. Estelle Tsai, just wanted to point out that fortunately we have a governor who will probably resist at least the best possible 
um, the imposition of mandatory minimums, but to the extent there is, and I think the diversionary programs, which will be addressed likely by the candidates who will be, you'll be hearing from next, the uh, district attorneys will be very essential. Um, I think that it is critical that uh, we ensure that uh, the individuals who are uh, given every opportunity to do things like community college and be, uh, be able to participate in society. There's no point in uh, making sure that they sit in jail forever. John Macaretta. The more mandatory sentences you have, the less need you have for judges. Unfeeling robots can simply read a statute and say, this is automatically what you get. That is not the way the system is designed. Every party, every human being, has a right to have their unique story heard and considered. Now, if you're against mandatory sentences, and you should be, that means that you give the judges more discretion. And that means you, the voters, really need to pay attention and make sure that discretion is given to people who are smart and fair and compassionate and can make the right decisions when you give them that power. Thank you. Um, so I think we have a few minutes left um, where you could give a final statement if you'd like. Um, if you could keep the statement to about 30 seconds, um, just like your introduction. Um, if we want to, we can start um, down the line with, you have the microphone. It's my I started the opening, I'll start the closing, that's fine. John Macaretta, button number 16. First recommended by the Bar Association, very proud to say that's a, that's a serious process that you should consider as well. I like to think that I have a diversity in life and in the law that makes me a good judge. I practice in every court in the city from the smallest municipal court case up to this Pennsylvania Supreme Court and the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. I've lived and worked all over the city from Northeast Philadelphia to the Navy Yard to Mount Airy where I live now. I have all kinds of jobs and life experience, a lot of experience with kids. All of that combined makes me aware of the many unique stories. It's one city but we all have our own realities. That's an important thing for a judge to know and an experience to bring to the bench. Hopefully you'll consider that. John Macaretta, number 16. Okay. Terry Booker, number 39. Um, I, I was born here in Philly and I was raised in Camden, New Jersey. Um, I'm licensed to practice law in three states, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. I passed the bar the first time, every time. Um, I work with children. ACE is called Advancing Civics Education because they took the civics out of the school, which is no accident. So I teach the uh, students once a month their rights, their constitutional rights, their right to vote, those types of things, because it's important. As I keep saying, knowledge is power. If we know what we need to do, then we know what we can change. And we know that we have the power to do so. I also work with the Christian Legal uh, Clinics of Philadelphia. We uh, give out free services, whatever it may be, expungements, wills, uh, custody, whatever the case is, if you come to the clinic, we can give you legal advice for free, and we can also even take the case, whatever is necessary. Um, those are the things that I that I do, and um, I ho hope you vote for number 39. Um, again, if um, preface with your name, and try to keep your statement to under 30 seconds, if possible. So my name is Stella Tsai. Um, I am a sitting judge, as I mentioned before, and I am working very hard to ensure that we deliver uh, fair, ser fair service to our citizens. Um, I uh, am the child, as I said before, of immigrants who um, come from a country where uh, it was a totalitarian regime and it is, was essential to them to come to a place where we can all enjoy the benefits of freedom. And in order to protect our freedoms, we need to ensure that we have a safe, or easy way, but independent and strong judiciary. Um, and with my career uh, for 30 years or so in practicing law, um, I believe that uh, what I do from day to day uh, and, and honors that service. So thank you for your time, and my name is Delta. Leon Goodman, number 26. Integrity, compassion, and experience. 
Those are the three models of my uh, campaign for judge. We already know what happens when we don't have integrity. We've all seen it in the news. You need to have judges with compassion because justice must always be tempered with mercy. And you need experience because, frankly, life experience is like wisdom. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge, and you want someone that has wisdom because wisdom will ensure fairness to all. Lifelong resident of Philadelphia, Central High School, North Carolina Central, Villanova University, and I went back for my master's at Temple. So that having been said, I'm recommended by numerous unions, progressive wards, and the Philadelphia Gay News. Remember, integrity, compassion, and experience, number 26. Good evening, I'm Mark Moore, ballot number 37. My model is delivering justice fairly with wisdom and experience. I've been re recommended by the Philadelphia Bar Association, endorsed by the Guardian Civic League and the Black Clergy. Um, I've had the experience, I've been a lifelong well, a trial attorney for almost 20 years, and those are the types of things that I will bring to the bench. I humbly ask for your vote on May 16th, ballot number 37. Thank you. Zach Schaefer, button number 31. When you go to vote, just remember that judges matter. If you vote for me, you're going to have someone that has dedicated his life to the pursuit of justice. Someone that in the past 26 years, there's only been 20 people that have been exonerated in Philadelphia. One of those people is a client of mine that I talked about earlier. You're going to have someone that has always represented the people, that's for the people, that's community oriented, and is gonna make sure everyone gets their fair day in court and looks for creative solutions instead of mandatory, man, excuse me, mandatory minimum sentences. Deborah Canty, button number 27. I am recommended by the Philadelphia Bar Association and one of my slogans is, my biggest slogan, my justice is balanced with compassion. I believe what uniquely sets me apart is the time spent as a social worker along with my master's in social work. And so that's what enables me to have compassion as I'm listening to people in their cases and making sure that justice is measured out fairly. Wendy Barish, number 29. I am a proud product of the public schools and public assistance programs in the city. And I'm running to be a judge because whether we want to be or not, we're in a new type of civil rights movement right now and we need people to protect the rights of everyone in this room. I know that I was afforded certain privileges throughout my life just because of how I look, that I may not have earned. And there are many people that are on the opposite side of that and that are constantly at a disadvantage. We need people that have judges on the bench that understand that and the sensitivity to treat people compassionately and with fairness. And I would appreciate your support on May 16th. Lucretia Clemens, button number 40. Not only do black lives matter, black robes matter. In my view, having sat on the bench for almost a year, there are two things that are most important in being a judge. You got to know the law and you have to care. But number 40, thank you. My name is Vicki Christensen on button number 14. Um, I am running because as someone who has worked on behalf of survivors of trauma my whole career, I want to run a courtroom that is trauma informed. So that means that everybody, everybody in the courtroom is proceeding with the consciousness of a goal of restorative justice and completely avoiding any re-traumatization of every person who comes into that courtroom. Vicki Christensen, Court of Common Pleas, number 14. Thank you. Danielle Patterson, I'm number 38. In 2005, I became the second African-American female member of the Millionaire Advocates Club here in Philadelphia, meaning that I had verdicts or settlements in record in excess of a million dollars. It is 2017, there still is no number three. Why is that? Because the Philadelphia bar lacks diversity and our Philadelphia benches lack diversity. We're here at a Black Lives Matter event. Well, you wanna make sure that Black Lives Matter? Put some black bodies in those black robes so that there is equal access to justice for all. Danielle Patterson, number 38. I'm Henry Sias, number 18. I've been working in the courts for a decade, working on criminal records reform, working on indigent de uh, defense reform. Uh, but I'm asking for your support for, for a reason that's bigger than me. I think it would be incredibly meaningful for the first time in Philadelphia's history, 
for the city to embrace an openly transgender candidate. I think that would be a beacon of hope for a lot of people who are experiencing darkness and hopelessness right now. So I ask for your support next Tuesday. I'm Henry Sias, number 18. Thank you. I want to thank all of the candidates for joining us tonight. Um, so give them another round of applause. Um, remember on Tuesday that on your ballot you can vote for up to nine candidates for the Court of Common Pleas.